Miracles have occurred throughout history, but are there supernatural answers for the emotional, financial, physical, and spiritual needs we face today? Miracles still happen, and in the next few moments, Sam Luke will share practical insights into knowing the God of miracles. Join Sam and the Victory Tabernacle Church family as we encounter a God who makes miracles still happen. Hello, Pastor Sam here, and welcome to Miracles Still Happen. Today is a very unique program, and I'll tell you why. You and I are living in times that were prophesied thousands of years ago. We are seeing the systematic persecution of Christians around the world. It has been estimated that as many as a hundred million Christians are living under persecution around the world. We know about the thousands that have been murdered in Syria. We know about ISIS. And today on the program, I'm going to talk to you about a mark, a mark that designates a person as a Christian in an Arab caliphate is a death sentence. And you're going to see it. And then when you see the mark, you'll have an opportunity to unite with persecuted Christians around the world. And I'm going to tell you more about that a little later on. But I want you to know that this was prophesied in Scripture. Jesus warned us that in the last days men would hate us without a cause. Today, everything is politically correct uh, about uh, the Muslim religion, about uh, homosexuality, gay marriage, uh, everything. Who would have thought that in the 21st century in America, anybody that speaks up for the unborn would be guilty of hate speech? And yet that's the way that it's turned out here uh, in uh, our, our day. So here's what I'm trying to tell you. This is another sign of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And I want to share that with you. Now, my question is simple. Would you be willing to die for Jesus Christ? Would you give him your life? Well, here is the shocking truth. You must. You must. Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Paul said it's a faithful saying. If we are dead with him, we shall also live with him. They that are Christ, Paul said, have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. Are you willing to be marked with him? Let's go into that service now, and I want you to hear this message on the mark of the Nazarene, and I want to talk to you about are you willing to die for Christ? And then we'll come together for a very special prayer, and I've got something that I want to share with you. So stay tuned as we go into that service right now. I'm asking you today, would you be willing to die for Christ? Now, here's something that's going to shock you. You must. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. Turn with me in your Bible to Romans, the sixth chapter. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. I think I'll read verses 4 through 11, so follow along with me. And I'm reading from the Living Bible. It says, Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when he died. And when God the Father with glorious power brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. For you have become a part of him, and so you died with him, so to speak, when he died. And now you share his new life and shall rise as he did. Your old evil desires were nailed to the cross with him. That part of you that loves to sin was crushed and fatally wounded so that your sin-loving body is no longer under sin's control, no longer needs to be a slave to sin. For when you are deadened to sin, you are freed from all its allure and its power over you. And since your old sin-loving nature died with Christ, we know that you will share his new life. 
Christ rose again from the dead and will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. He died once for all to end sin's power, but now he lives forever in unbroken fellowship with God. So look upon your old sin nature as dead and unresponsive to sin and instead be alive to God, alert to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Without a death to self, there is no escape from the power of Satan. All the vices and sins of men and fallen angels have their root in the proud atheism of self. Human nature is totally depraved, and men are dead to God because they are living to him themselves. Is it any wonder that Paul says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust? Is it any wonder that he said in Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Is it any wonder that as a way uh, of personal testimony, he says in Galatians 2 and 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here in man's innermost being, self had its awful birth reigning over a kingdom of secret pride. And self must die because self must always have the preeminence. The nature of selfishness is first revealed in the angel Lucifer. While he was still an angel in God's heaven in Isaiah 14, he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus reminisces when he sees his disciples coming back all pumped up and proud and, and, and uh, about uh, their exploits. He said, the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus said, you know, you remind me of Satan when I cast him out of heaven. Your silly self-exaltation reminds me of, of Satan when he said, uh, I will exalt my throne. And, and so I had to drop kick him out of heaven. And uh, he said, don't rejoice because of your great exploits and your abilities and what you've been able to accomplish, but rejoice because your name is written in heaven. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 17, he said, The flesh lusts against the Spirit. In Ephesians 2 and 3, he said, There was a time when we were sinners and gave in to the lust of the flesh and fulfilled the desires of the flesh. In Philippians 3 and 3, he makes it clear that we are not to put confidence in the flesh. In Romans 13, and 14, he says we are to make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Jesus said to his disciples, he who overcomes will reign with me. Overcomes what? I said, oh, we got to overcome the devil. No, we don't. Jesus did that. Jesus defeated the devil. We don't overcome the devil. Christ did that. Well, I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't know what he was talking about. Well, let me tell you what he was talking about. He was talking about the flesh. If you can overcome self, then you will reign with Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 4, beginning verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, which means lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now today, I intend in the next few minutes to help you, and together we are going to die. I thought about titling this message, How I Died and Lived to Tell About It. We're going to die. The old man, everybody say the old man, and I'm not talking about your husband. I know you ladies just had a wonderful uh, conference, but I'm not talking about your husband when I say the old man has to die. I'm talking about the flesh. I'm talking about the carnal man. I'm talking about that that part of you that cannot have fellowship with God, that part of you that cannot hear from God. And we're going to uh, make sure that the old man dies today. Now, I need your help. 
That's what this mark is about. Today, every one of us will receive this mark. Now, I know that this is going out maybe on uh, in places where people don't understand what this is, and I want you to get a good look at it. I think, did we put that up on the, uh, the screen? Did they see this uh, noon, this N that stands for the, the Nazarene? Did we, uh, did we put that up earlier? And uh, if you could do that, I see them scrambling up there. But if you could put that up, I want you to have that mark. And one of the reasons I want you to have it is because today when you go to eat or uh, even if you go home, you'll be reminded all day long that, first of all, there are people who have been martyred for the cause of Christ. And they're not ashamed to be identified with him. And secondly, as a believer in the United States, maybe they're not threatening to kill you yet, but at least you need to know that the world is not your friend that Satan is not your friend. Amen? Hello? There were two corn chips talking. One of them said, I don't like you anymore. And the other one said, why? He says, I'm not your friend. And the other one said, can we taco about it? But anyway, I want you to get one of these marks. And when you look at it, you'll say, wait a minute, am I willing to die for Christ? Well, the answer is, of course you are. And today, the part of you that grieves the Holy Spirit, the part of you that cannot live a holy life is going to die. You see, the corruption of the world comes out of the flesh. When you and I were born into this world, we were born with Adam's nature. We had a sinful nature. David said, I was shapen in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. So when people see this today, they're going to say, what is that, Pastor? Did you forget to wash your hands? I'll say, no, this is the mark of the Nazarene. And I have been born again. I have passed from death unto life. That old man is dead. And Jesus Christ lives in in me, hallelujah. So when I say the old man must die, your response should be, die, old man. Let's practice. Not yet. <laughs> Are you ready? When I tell you, I'm going to say, the old man must die, and I want you to shout, die, old man. You ready? The old man must die. Die, old man. We're going to do it today. Now touch somebody and say, I'm going to die today. Why must he die? The old man must die because he is a doubter. One day a man brought his son to Jesus who was vexed by a demon. He said, Jesus, if you can do anything, please help us out. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. What did he say? Now watch this. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. What does that mean? That means there's a part of me that believes everything God says in his word and cannot doubt. That's the measure of faith that God's given to every man. But there's also a part of me that doubts everything that God says. And that man cannot receive anything from God. Did you know that 6,000 promises in this book are held in reserve in the heavenlies for those who by faith will reach up and claim them? Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without what? Faith. It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm going to get plain. You want me to get plain today? Somebody the other day said, Pastor, when you're preaching and you hear people go, oh, don't you hear it? I said, yeah, that's when I know I'm really anointed. I'm going to get plain with you. Some of you are claiming, oh, I just need a miracle of healing. i got to have it. I'm desperate for it. And you never receive it, but you never exercise your faith. You never have any faith to receive a healing. You see, Isaiah 53, 750 years before Christ was even born in Bethlehem, revealed the problem when it says, who has believed our report? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The unbelievers are not going to be healed because they cannot believe God. But if the old man dies and that new man comes, alive you can claim your healing in Jesus name amen you say, oh, I know people get healed don't have any faith that's right they got healed on somebody else's faith 
Look at the book of uh, Acts. All through the book of Acts, even uh, in Jesus' ministry, there were people that were uh, healed who did not know who he was. So how could they have any faith in him? They didn't even know who he was. Jesus healed the blind man, and after he's healed, and they threw him out of the temple because he was trying to tell the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, that Jesus had healed them, and they hated Jesus. Jesus said, uh, uh, do you believe on the Son of God? He said, incredulously, who is he that I might believe? So many of the people that Jesus healed had no idea who he was. In the book of Acts, they did miracle after miracle, and they were done uh, for people that did not have faith. But once you become a child of God, God expects you to operate in your faith. Somebody say amen. amen. Tell you what I'm talking about. I've got one child. got one in glory and one on the earth. And God's put into her life a, a, a Christian man that they're going to be married looks like in April and uh, so they're planning a, a wedding I tried to tell her so honey I will give you not I'm not I'm not uh, saying something out of school because I've told her I said I will give you a check right now for five thousand dollars if you'll run away and and elope <laughs> save me a lot of money just take it put it a down payment on a house or something oh no I gotta have a wedding I gotta have a big wedding and uh, so I've been trying to talk her out of it to, to no avail. But growing up, I only had that one daughter at home. And so as much as I loved the other little children in church, the only responsibility I had as a parent was that one daughter. So I could say her to things like, you can't go here, you can't do this, you can't, this is not going to happen in our house, this is not permissible. I would do things for her, I would have to discipline her, but I'd also reward her. And that, that wasn't something I did for every child in the church because she was mine. You say, well, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Are you a child of God? If you're a child of God, thou, you're obligated to your father to obey him. You're obligated to him when he corrects you to receive it. You have to operate in your faith. He's not going to allow somebody else's faith to stand in for yours because now you are a child of God and you've got to act like a child of God. Amen? So this old nature has to die so that you can believe God for his promises. Amen? Now, here's the other thing. The old nature has to die. Oh, man, you must die. That is pitiful. Some of you don't want him to die. That's the problem. Lord, just let him get sick and come back to life on Monday. Oh, man, you must die. Now we're getting someplace. See, we have to crucify him because he's a troublemaker. Not only is it impossible for him to, to believe God's promises, but he's going to cause you trouble. Romans chapter 8, verses 4 through 6 tells us, don't mind the things of the flesh. Verses 12 and 13 tells us not to live after the flesh, but to mortify the deeds of the flesh. This old man will wreck and ruin our lives, and he'll ruin society. That's why we've got gay marriage. I know you don't like to hear about about it, but gay marriage, gay marriage, gay marriage. And, and that's why <laughs> and that's why we've got abortion. Nobody wants to hear about abortion, but I'm going to tell it like it is. 4,200 babies are, are, are murdered every day in Christian America because of selfishness, because of the flesh. Psychiatrists counsel their patients and tell them, uh, don't let the, 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 the mores and the morals and the, uh, the, of, of, your, of your parents and your church uh, uh, continue to disturb you. Throw off all restraint because you're just feeling guilty for no reason. Whatever you feel good about, just do that and follow the path that gives you peace. But out of that old nature comes the corruption of this world. Oh, man, you must die. Die. Oh, you're getting better at this. You're getting better at this. Now, he's a troublemaker. Let me tell you something that, that happened. And this is a true story. There was a young man, and uh, he went to a gentleman's club. How many of you know that's a misnomer? There are no gentlemen up in there. <laughs> How many of you know that? But they say it's a gentleman's club. So women get up there and take the clothes off, and, and uh, he's sitting there, and he's thinking, Wow. 
you know, sure would like to go to bed with her. And he says, uh, excuse me, honey, what time do you get off? And she told him. And uh, so they had a rendezvous. And the next morning, now this is a, a, a CPA. He's a professional man. He's got four children, lovely wife at home. Next morning he wakes up and goes into the bathroom. She's gone and she has scrawled on the bathroom mirror with a lipstick, welcome to the wonderful world of AIDS. And he drives his car to the Sunshine Parkway Bridge in Tampa, Florida, and jumps off 110 feet, kills himself, and when they found his car, he had scrawled a poem. He'd written a poem and just wadded it up and he threw it in the dashboard of his car. And this is what it said. I'm standing on the threshold of eternity at last, as reckless of the future as I've been of the past. I'm void of all ambition, dead of every hope. The toils of life are ending. I'm letting go the rope. You know who's to blame for that? That old nature. That old nature. Old man, you must die. die old, man. old man, you must die. die old man. Listen to this. You know why he's got to die? He's blind. He can't hear. He can't see. He's blind. Jesus, when he was reprimanded by the religious leaders of his day for the miracles that he performed on the Sabbath, they said to him, you're breaking the Jewish law. He said, I only do what I see my father do and I only speak what I hear him say. John 10, 4 and 5. He said, my sheep know my voice. Let me say that again. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. If you're blind and you're deaf, how can you ever be obedient to God? 60% of people who go to church in America are spiritually tone deaf. They're blind to the things of God. You've got ministers, so-called, that stand in the pulpit that have never had an encounter with Jesus Christ, know nothing of the saving grace of God. They've studied in school. They've got an education, and they're prolific. Some of them are authors. Some of them have, are very articulate in the way they share, and it, it's, it's entertaining maybe, but so sad that many of them have never heard the voice of of the Lord because they are deaf and they're blind. There's a song that we sing, and we're going to sing it in just a moment. I love it. It, it comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. You know, in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, God said, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you an heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. God wants to make you brand new. He doesn't want to just reform you. See, the problem today with our world is everybody thinks that all it takes is a little reprogramming. So we're going to take you somewhere and we're going to set you over here aside and you sit down there and now we're going to teach you why you're thinking wrong. And we've even got new names for old sins so that we can, you know, feel good about doing bad. And we tell people, oh, you don't really have a problem. You're not a drunk. You're an alcoholic. Oh, you're, you're, you're not a, a drug addict. You just have a problem with substance abuse. And so we try to tell them, all you need to do is to reprogram your mind. And you know a lot of Christians are buying into that. I don't care how many programs you go through until you're willing to allow God to supernaturally change your nature, you'll never be set free. I don't care how many books you read. I don't care if you attend the church of Oprah. And she says, you know, all religions are leading to the same place. All roads lead to God. And you buy into that and you begin to say, all I got to do is change my stinking thinking. I'll just get a check up from my neck up and pretty soon I'll be all right. And I just need positive thinking in my life. And I'm not saying that those things are wrong. The positive thinking is wrong or a positive attitude is wrong. We all need that. But what I'm saying is the only way that you and I can ever see God 
is to be born again. We've got to have a new nature and that old man must die. And it's going to happen today, right now, right now. Let's pray together right now, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, I commit my life to Jesus Christ. I surrender my will. Have your way in my life. Dear Jesus, be the Lord of my life. You died to save me, and I want to be crucified with you so that I can live for you in this wicked world. And when the time comes, I can go home and live with you forever in a place you've prepared called heaven. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Will you call me? 804-744-8881. Now listen, ordinarily at this time in the program, I tell you about all the things that we have to offer you and your family and invite you to come join us. And I want you to go to our website. You'll find all that on victorytab.org. But right now, what I want to talk to you about, as I promised, is how you can help persecuted Christians around the world through world missions. I want you to have this shirt with the mark of the Nazarene. You just call me, 804-744-8881. Tell me what size. We're going to send it to you. And when you get it, please send to us a love offering of any amount. We're not even selling these. But please, whatever you can do, send to us a love offering of any amount. And what we're going to do is take that money and use it for world missions to help people who are hurting around the world. So again, the number to call is 804-744-8881. Thank you so much for being a part of the program today. May the Lord bless you. And until we're together again like this around the Word of God, this is Pastor Sam reminding you that here at Victory Tabernacle, faith brings a victory and miracles still happen. If you would like to have one of these Mark of the Nazarene t-shirts, please call 804-744-8881 and we will promptly send out a shirt to you. All we ask is that you give a generous donation to help out those that are missionaries from around the world, those that are standing in the gap to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. 804-744-8881. Call us and let us know what size t-shirt you would like. Thank you and God bless you for supporting missionaries from around the world.